Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being with us. I'm Barbara Snyder, president of Case Western Reserve University, and it's great to welcome you to the newest building on our campus. One of the first things I got to do when I got here uh, in 2007 was to cut the ribbon to open this wonderful building, and it really was a lot of fun. Uh, we had Jack, Joe, and Mort Mandel with us for a wonderful celebration to dedicate this space. And of course, in the time since then, people like all of you here today have brought life to the Mandel's dream that its warm and elegant design would inspire students and faculty and others who visit us uh, to work in service for society. And we're going to have a great discussion today. This marks just the kind of dialogue that I know the Mandels envisioned. Uh, Mark Stefanski is the chairman and CEO of Third Federal Savings and Loan, a financial institution that refused to engage in the lucrative yet ultimately devastating practice of subprime lending. The decision meant that they missed out on lots of money, those profits that were being made, and probably lost some markets in which you'd been, had, had, a, had a stronghold, but, and, and I'm quoting from, from Mr. Stefanski here. He said, we were tempted to the New York Times in 2007, but we felt it wasn't the right thing to do. He didn't only avoid prime lending. He and his team at Third Federal worked actively to educate the community about borrowing and home ownership. Working with dozens of area partners, the Home Today program has helped more than 13,000 people become educated about home financing. And roughly 4,000 of those have gone on to successfully buy and keep homes. Mr. Stefanski and Third Federal have been invested in the future of Cleveland for a number of years. Founded in 1997, the Broadway Development Initiative includes a dramatically expanded headquarters complex, the Broadway Elderly Housing Project, and a home building project that has led to nearly 60 new homes in the Broadway neighborhood. In all, the company estimates that it's invested more than $50 million in the neighborhood. In December of 2008, Mr. Stefanski wrote a public letter explaining why Third Federal would not need to participate in the bank bailout program known as TARP. My parents founded Third Federal in 1938 to last. We still have plenty of money to lend, and we do so while sticking to our values of love, trust, respect, and a commitment to excellence. If more financial leaders were like Mr. Stefanski, Cleveland and our country would look very different today. It is a great pleasure to welcome Mr. Stefanski and Dr. Sharon Milligan, Associate Dean here at MSAS, to talk about the lending issues, the housing market, and values and culture in a company. Thank you both very much for being with us. Thank you very much. That was, that was very nice. And uh, I hope to get a copy of that so I can show my family so they <laughs> know and understand what I'm doing. And also, if you have a cell phone or a pager, it would help us if you would turn it off at this point. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I think we should get started. We can. OK. Well, as a city, and as a nation, we faced many challenges. And your being here is going to help us think about those challenges. The country is in a deep recession. Confidence is really low in terms of businesses. In many ways, the, the pillars of the American dream are shaking. Housing appreciation, employment. People you know, right now can depend on having the job that they might want. Unemployment rates are, are raising, mm -hmm. are rising. Or the erosion of savings, retirement plans are shaky. So, and, and, and as, a, as a country, we're uncertain as to where the floor is. Where's the bottom? What's the exit strategy for where we are? Uncertainty exists for people. It exists for institutions in neighborhoods, particularly urban neighborhoods. As a community leader, we're very happy to have you here and happy that you've agreed to have this conversation in Case Western Reserve. And we want to ask you, I think we, I just have to start with a very basic question here. 
I how does Cleveland? Get to question. Yeah, I'm there. I'm there. <laughs> how does Cleveland? Waiting. How does Cleveland and the nation navigate out of this housing and economic crisis? Well, that is an interesting question. Would anyone like to help me with that question? <laughs> um, uh, to say I don't know uh, might be a smart thing to say, but it is so complex. Uh, we have never, ever, uh, in recent times, ever gone through anything like this. I think the idea that this is going to be fixed in a short time, I think, is an absolute ridiculous fallacy. Uh, hopefully, you're not watching too much television. Uh, you can't help it, but um, everyone's looking for a quick fix. There is no quick fix. Uh, we are going to be in this deep uh, recession. I call it a depression, I think, for a little while. And a little while is longer than, you know, tomorrow morning, the year. Uh, it, you know, you can look back on history, and the last depression lasted 10 years. Um, it was three years before the stock market actually bottomed out. I think the things that we're seeing, um, they're just blips when you have something positive happening in the stock market. I think they're just blips. And uh, I, I think that it's wise for us to just be prepared for a long-term effect on, on all this. And you, you saw the unemployment uh, rates this morning. They're continuing to, to increase. And that's only for the people that have reported. But don't forget there's a lot of people that are working part-time jobs that don't have careers anymore that they're just you know, trying to get by. Maybe they didn't report and go in and apply for unemployment. So it's, uh, it's, it's real messy. And we're certainly turning to, to the White House and leadership f for uh, some practical approaches because there is a lot of noise coming out of Washington pertaining to uh, salaries and commissions and that kind of stuff, and I think it's just noise. That's not the central issue. It's not the issue. The issue is, is how do we get the whole economic engine going again? Did I answer your question? I think we're getting there. Okay. We're getting there. <laughs> and I'm sure there will be lots more questions from the audience. Uh, but sure. I, let me ask you another. You and your, your family uh, yes. and your company has been highly committed to Northeast Ohio. And I think it you know, would be helpful to hear a little bit about your philosophy in terms of, in view of all of what's going on in the banking industry, despite mm -hmm. um, the health of your, your company, your commitment to Northeast Ohio mm -hmm. and to Well, it, it's not new. You know, um, my dad started the company, my, and my mother. Actually, they're on their honeymoon uh, back in 1938 when they uh, went to Washington to apply for the charter. If you ever saw the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, it's, I'm not sure if the movie came out first or my parents did this. <laughs> and, and it's, you know, it's kind of hokey, but that's actually what happened. Um, and from the depths of the Depression, w my parents started Third Federal. And it's interesting, when you, when you are, are the son of a founder, uh, you, you have an interesting task because if the, if the business does well, the father had a good business. If the business doesn't do well, then the son messed it up. So my job, my job is to try to continue on uh, to hand it off to the next generation and, and not mess it up. And it, uh, every now and then I go to, to my parents' gravesite for spiritual advice. And it seems like the last time I was there, I was explaining to my mom and dad how, um, how well Third Federal was doing, hopefully how proud they'd be of, of the success and all that, and that I didn't screw it up. And as I walked away, I thought I heard a voice that said, there's still time. <laughs> <laughs> so my challenge is much, much different than, than a hired executive. Uh, I grew up in a family that uh, all we did was talk about the business. Uh, my brother Ben, who was helping uh, see people um, was a big, big factor in, uh, in the success story as far as I'm concerned. Uh, second father to me and, and someone who's uh, has been a mentor to, for me and uh, uh, my success at, at Third Federal. Uh, but it's no small task and um, we have a commitment to our values which is love, trust, commitment to excellence, treating one another with respect and having fun. Having fun with one another, not at yeah. someone's expense. Um, Unless they ask for it, and then we give it to them. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, uh, we do make business decisions based on our value system. It's a completely different model than you're going to find anywhere else in the country. Uh, we actually think about how 
the products and services that we have for our public uh, in all the markets that we serve. We actually try to figure out how that all fits into our value system. So if we're putting someone into a home that doesn't qualify, that we can make money on that, sure. But that's not what we're in business for. We say no. We actually say no to people. You don't qualify. You can get education. You can improve your status. You can do this. You can, you can come up with a myriad of different ways that we can help you in the future. But right now might not be a good time to put you in that home. And because of that, I mean, we didn't do the subprime lending thing, but, uh, and we did lose market share. Mm -hmm. Love, respect, and I, there was another. I can do it the way I memorize okay. it. Love, <laughs> tr love, trust, respect. Love, trust, and respect. And commitment to excellence and, okay. and fun. How does that play out in terms of how you um, work or function as a leader? Well, I am the keeper of the values. Mm -hmm. I need to demonstrate that day in and day out in terms of how I conduct myself at work. Um, I try to do it at home. It's not as easy as at home as it is to do at work. Um, try to instill those values in my family and to everyone I come in contact with. Um, as I said, it's a different model. Uh, the, the most difficult part is at, at times, as uh, Barbara was kind enough to mention in those remarks, that. Uh, we do lose market share, we do lose money to someone else, uh, which you know kills me. I'm a very competitive person, but we need to make sure that the people that are going to be in those homes are going to be partners of ours for a long time. And all we ask is that they pay us back. I mean, it's not that difficult. We don't ask anything more than just meet the terms of the agreement and, and pay us back. Okay. I want to ask one more question before we turn it over to the audience. We have two microphones in the audience, but I, I wanted to have you share with us how you see the relationship or the role of education uh, in terms of revitalizing community and the work in, that you do as a leader in the community. Mm -hmm. Well, education obviously is critical. And education has been, um, um, well, I want to say this so I'm not as direct as I was with the group of students. <laughs> Uh, they were tough on you. Oh, they were tough. <laughs> but I was a lot more candid, a lot more direct. Uh, no, what, I, th I think that the, the di most difficult thing about it is that if you look at uh, the city of Cleveland, for example, with a budget of over $750 million, I think Kurt, you said $711 to be exact. Um, I just find it hard to believe how, how our children can't be educated in the inner city. My observation early on was that uh, the, the high school programs were terrific. They had scholarships and, and all kinds of ways to help kids get to college. But the fourth and fifth graders, the third graders, second graders, um, uh, when you see how the educational system was working at that level, you'd have to scratch your head and say, well, how in the world can these folks, how these kids can get to the next level? How can they even get to high school, given what, the, what they're facing? And so uh, we develop programs early on uh, through a foundation that my wife and I had and through funding with Third Federal uh, to uh, get people in the community, hire docents that would go out and, uh, and mentor and to uh, tutor these kids. Uh, we also had volunteers from Third Federal. Unbeknownst to me, they heard about the program, they didn't want to get paid, so we had uh, 10, 12 people go out in the community and actually uh, do this work for free for nothing with kids. And uh, so we did that with uh, some of the surrounding areas in Slavic Village, some of the public schools. And we got some great, great reviews from the teachers, uh, the math teachers especially, and the principals, how uh, effective the, the uh, programs were. So I took those and I sent them to the mayor and uh, the uh, chief educator at the time, whose name escapes me. Um, because I won't mention Not a superintendent. Uh, no. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> and, and we never heard back from him. And I think the idea was is that it was embarrassing for him to see that someone in the community was doing something. And it was just hard for people to work in that political environment and, uh, and, and educate. And, and I think it's still a challenge. I think it's still a challenge. And that's why we've committed a million dollars to the family, uh, the family uh, academy. And we're involved in a lot of other different programs that probably no, none of you will ever hear about, which is fine with me. We don't do things in the community to get the attention of the media. We don't do things in the community so I can get or we can get accolades um, 
or special plaques or awards. That's not the purpose why we do things. We do things because it's the right thing to do to support our communities. We do the right things uh, with our customers because it's the right thing to do, not necessarily to get media and, and uh, glossy paper on it. Okay, it's your turn. By the way, before you start, I, my reflexes are good, so if you're throwing shoes, <laughs> I still play ball with my kids at home, so I can. <laughs> yes, sir. And you're a runner. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the foundation that Third Federal has uh, uh, started uh, a sure. year ago? So. Sure. Uh, about two years ago, we did a public offering. And part of the rules and regulations that we were governed by in the public offering allowed us to set up a foundation. So we set up a foundation with those proceeds for $50 million that uh, the primary purpose is to give back to the community. You know, the, uh, the laws that the, uh, Washington made up, uh, one of the biggest ones is CRA, Community Reinvestment Act. Uh, we've been doing that CRA stuff long before there were rules that told us we had to do some, something like that. And uh, so we've been committed to that right along. This is just a beautiful way for us to give even more back to the community in uh, education, in housing, in, uh, to different community development groups, and uh, for, uh, for education in terms of uh, bigger donations. Because we've always been involved, certainly behind the scenes. And you may have seen some of the things uh, that are more public now. And we want it to be public. I can't wait to embarrass anyone else out there and challenge them to give more money, to give more support to the right organizations. So I, I think it's, uh, it's a great thing that we're doing. Kirk Carrickle is here, who's the president of that foundation. So if you want uh, a donation, you should see him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. There's been quite Take a it. political argument going back and forth as to the extent to which CRA is enforcement in the was a significant cause of the subprime crisis. What's your view? Oh, sure. There's a, there's a lot of blame. A lot of blame. I mean, you can say it's anywhere from Fannie Mae, CRA, um, greed on Wall Street, uh, creative products, um, the politicians that uh, were looking the other way. Um, I got a litany of, of hit list, you know, people that I could, I could name, which I won't. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's part of it, I'd say. You can't, you can't regulate people to do the right thing. I mean, think about Sarbanes-Oxley. Now, how did that help us in this mess? It created a lot of jobs for accountants uh, and a lot of regulation, but it didn't. If someone's going to be crooked, they're going to go bad no matter what you do. And you can't regulate that. You can't regulate values. You can't regulate commitment to the communities. You can try, but I, I just don't see how that can happen and happen effectively. Um, along the same line, uh, uh, are there ways that when, it, when you look at the lending market um, and the subprime market that was out there, were there things that could have been put in place or should there be things that can be put in place? You, you have lots of additional staff that you don't pay called government regulators that like to visit you. Um, but are there uh, uh, the non-regulated markets that should come under some umbrella at least to keep people honest from this occurring again? Again, I don't know if, if someone wants to cheat you. They're going to figure out a way to do it, no matter what regulation you have in place. You know, the heart and soul of our country really ends up being our value system. We have a lot of good, honest people. And it's just a handful of folks that, that go in a wrong direction but get a lot of press. Um, and, and it's a shame. It's a shame. But, you know, we're, we're all uh, very well educated. We're, we're a very helpful group of people, United States citizens. I mean, we help people all day long. That's been our history. Um, I don't know how you regulate that to make it better. Um, I can tell you when our regulators come in, one of the key things that they gave us uh, a, lot of, a lot of heat about was they wanted to make sure that everyone working for the organization took their two weeks vacation. It's like, okay, they went to Washington Mutual and checked 40,000 people's vacations, and that did a lot of good. I think that's one of the most stupid things to check. I mean, who's taking two weeks vacation? I mean, they're looking the other way. They're, we're, we're afraid of the wrong things sometimes. And I think if we just depend on one another, um, have a, live by a value system, and really believe in it, I think it helps a lot. But to say we can do more to regulate the bad guy, 
I don't know how you do that. We're go I got a feeling we're going to try. <laughs> and that could be worse than, than anything. Yes, sir. I venture to say that there are a lot of people on Wall Street who, if they were here today, I, I don't even need this, I don't think. Can you all hear me? Uh, a lot of people on Wall Street, if they were here today, might agree with you entirely and say, our value systems are similar to yours. What did you and your people see, particularly given the pressure you were under? You mentioned earlier you were competitive. There must have been a lot of people pounding on you and saying, hey, come on, Mark. You're going to get a heck of a lot more business than you've got. You're a relatively small player in this big arena. What did you see and your people see that the rest of the world didn't see? Well, it, it's interesting because we make a lot of decisions in a team atmosphere. And I was one of the ones that said, you know, if everyone's doing this, shouldn't we be doing something like this? And actually, it was, it was our team that said, you know, if we're making loans, if we're doing business in the community, given our value system, how can we consciously go out and do the kinds of things that are being done? It just doesn't make sense. Negative amortization doesn't make sense. And so, you know, certainly I'd like to take all the credit. But that's not... That's not the reality of the situation. The reality of the situation is we have a lot of good people with, uh, with a, a high standard and a high value system, and we're in it for the long run. As I said, the next generation of Stefanskis, I've got to hold on to this thing until the next generation's ready. <laughs> so my mission is, is different than a lot of other folks. And yes, we do want to make money, and yes, we do want to stay in business, and making more money is good. But in addition to what I talked about the values, I, I look at um, making money in a corporation being equivalent to a human being breathing air. In that human beings, as human beings, we all breathe air, but that's not our sole purpose. And same as a corporation, sole purpose is not just to make money. Our commitment to the community, our commitment to, to our customers, our commitment to society in general is much, much bigger and a much more, uh, much bigger task than I think a lot of people think about day in and day out. Yes, sir. Well, when you were making those decisions initially to resist that, were you a public company? Did you have stockholders to answer to at that time, or did you become public after, you know, that corruption, if you sense, was underway? Uh, I think we were at afterward. We became a public company in 2007. Well, I mean, a lot of organizations would have stockholders pressuring directors, the board, and, and executives to make that money. Yeah. And, and as you become public now, does it become more difficult? Really? So no. You know why? You know why? Because the, the paradigm is going to shift. Because, I, 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 just my opinion, I think the paradigm is going to shift where it used to be, and this is banking and finance 101, I think, or whatever it was when I was here <laughs> for a short time, um, uh, that the, the, the mission of a management team was to maximize shareholders' wealth or equity. And I don't believe that to be true. I believe that shareholders should benefit from the growth of the organization. I believe that shareholders will benefit as long as the company's doing the right thing, investing in the right products for the right reasons and not being too greedy. And we can see, and it's been demonstrated in the last two years, what greed and what uh, creativeness can do to an organization. Because I don't think there's a shareholder today that's going to stick around and, and say, oh, yep, now you're going to make me more money. I mean, if your stock price is holding its own, I think everyone would be really happy. If there's moderate or reasonable, rational growth, I think stockholders will be happy in the future. Uh, really? And that's the paradigm, I think, that's shifting. I'm sorry, a related yes. question. Um, your company started in 1938, but you right. became public in April of 2007. Yeah. What was your thinking in terms of, your family's thinking, in terms of the time frame of, of you know, becoming public much, you know, almost after 70 years, for about 70 years? Right, well, we knew all this was going to happen. We needed more capital. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> Very simple explanation. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, not to be flippant. I, the timing was right, and uh, we had done a lot of things that we felt that we needed to do, and I think to remain competitive, given the kind of international 
competition that we were facing, we wanted to have more capital. Okay. And uh, that was one way to do it. It was the cheapest way to do it. We could have done preferred stock. We could have done any kind of uh, magical, mystical thing that Wall Street was dreaming up at the time. The safest thing seemed to be, and the cheapest thing seemed to be, to do a public offering. And uh, sometimes it just seems to work out well. Yes. Mark, are you planning to expand geographically? Well, we are expanding right now. Broward County uh, is one of our focal points right now. We've opened up four, well, we'll have four branches, I think, by the uh, mid-June in Broward County. And I think it'll probably slow down a little bit till we can get a handle on the growth of those branches along with uh, the, what's the best way to go about uh, managing our capital in the future. Because fast growth right now I don't think gets us where we want to be, at least gets me to the next generation. So I want to make sure that that's, uh, that's one of my missions. How <laughs> Are you anxious to see me step aside? <laughs> They're anywhere from 25 to 12. Mark. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you think, how, how are we going to solve this problem of the CEOs getting 15, 16 million dollars a year and more and the stock is going down? Because getting a few annual reports now and I always look at that yeah. and it's not good no. and I think it's been let go for a long, long time. I was wondering what your opinion of that problem is. Actually, that's, that's a multifaceted question because uh, there are companies out there that um, took the TARP money. I sent some TARP money to my, uh, to, hold on a sec, I took some, <laughs> I sent some TARP money to my daughter because she lives in New York uh, to put in her account because she was <laughs> a little low and uh, I, I misspelled it. It was TRAP, T-R-A-P. <laughs> so you have the TARP money uh, organizations <laughs> that are out there and uh, they're in a pickle the big ones because of what's going on and uh, I don't know I, I kind of think that that is um, for lack of a better way to put it a lot of noise that needs to be resolved but that's not the central issue of what the heck's going on um, I, I think that shareholders have a lot to say um, the folks that did a lot of the damage aren't there anymore um, we're in a capitalistic society I, I don't know I don't know where the top is on, on salary uh, or benefits. Um, we're an incentive-based environment. Um, I, I just, I don't know how you quantify it and where you say enough is enough. Um, if the company's doing well, I guess it's, it's market-driven. Um, if the company's not doing well, you certainly have to retain good people to get it through this phase. Um, and you wished it never went that way. Yeah. Has taken a hundred thousand dollars a year salary, and of course the stock has done very well. It's not doing good now, but anybody who had invested years ago would be way ahead of the game. Yeah. And uh, I think that, you know, he's very. I've heard him speak a couple of times. He's very unhappy with this sa situation of the golden parachutes. Yeah. Well, for sure. And, and if you take a look at some of the folks, and yeah, you know, I think that the one of the worst models out there is the GE model where they had this gargantuous uh, pot that they had these executives fight for and fight over, and then the CEO you know, got, got the holy grail, and the rest of the guys went to other bigger corporations and walked away with a lot of money um, and didn't even work for GE anymore. But that's what they were guaranteed. Um, and in addition to that, they'd say, well, I don't want to go to Chrysler um, unless you pay me as much as I would have gotten uh, from, from GE. Um, yeah, it, it's messy, it, no, no doubt about it. Um, but somebody's got to do the work, and, and I don't know. The AIG thing is really screwy. I mean, I, if, if AIG went into bankruptcy, I think a bankruptcy judge actually would have said, well, this is fine to run the business. But it's become a political, you know, hot button, I think, for, for the folks in Washington, with all due respects to all the folks in Washington. But um, it, it's a problem, and it's getting a lot of sexy, you know, headlines. And I, d I don't think that's the issue. I, I just don't. I don't know if I really answered your question. 
I think I talked like a politician enough to get to the next one. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, since 1938, uh, when your parents got the original charter, it was to be a savings and loan. That's correct. And since 1938, as a nation, we have stopped being a nation of savers. Uh, part of the problem that we're in today. Mm -hmm. In your community work, do you uh, try to address that problem at all? To encourage savings? And is there any hope that you'll start to save? I think a lot of people are saving more than ever before. I mean, and I think if you ask um, around, that's one of the problems because we want people to spend more money and to borrow more money, which is exactly the problem that we had that caused the, the breakdown. Um, it, it's, not, it's not a real easy solution. Uh, people are afraid, and uh, we've experienced all kinds of unusual transactions at our offices. Uh, people will come in and want their want thirty or forty thousand dollars in cash immediately, and we'll count it out and get it all ready for them. And then, and then they'll say, "Well, I changed my mind," and then they'll take it from our organization and go somewhere else, or go from other organization and bring it to us. Um, one thing that was very very helpful was when the FDIC changed uh, to two hundred fifty thousand. Did you have that, an influx of savings? We continue to have an influx, and uh, what what stopped was that people trying to figure out how much money they had somewhere, and then try to spread it around real fast. Uh, I think a lot of people took cash, and they're holding it somewhere. I don't know where you would put it. <laughs> I would just give it to my wife, because it goes there anyway. <laughs> but um, it's, it's been a very, very interesting and strange thing to watch. And, and people just want to be reassured that their money is safe. And, you know, that's, that's been our mission. Along with paying competitive rates, I think helps too. Now, on the other side, we're talking about lending a lot, but on the other side, if you look at um, the, the crazy savings rates that were going on out there, uh, to the benefit of the public, but yet to the detriment of the organizations, they were just trying to maintain liquidity. And uh, really, talk about lending without conscience, this is like putting money on your books without conscience, because there's no way you can take it in at 3 or 5% and lend it out at, you know, the same amount and, and make money on it. Yes, sir. Uh, Mark, talking about the future, um, other than Freddie Mac and uh, Fannie Mae, larger loans, can anybody bundle those and get insurance on them anymore, or are the rates going to go through the... Is there any lending being done at all oh, yeah. on that? Yeah, there's plenty of lending going on. How are those rates? Yeah, our mortgage rates right now are below 5%. I mean, that should make everyone go out and buy a house. How about large projects? I'm talking about <laughs> hotels or <laughs> medical <laughs> market. You know, it's, it, seems, it, it, it seems to me there's no insurance anymore. That's why I'm wondering. Uh, yeah, the medical market thing, you have to talk to the county commissioners about that. I, I'm not sure. Uh, a, a, a lending for everything else. I'll tell you what. One of the benefits of, of, uh, that we've reaped from being very focused is being solvent and, and being able to see us through the next to the next storm. And I'll tell you what, my learning curve would be really high when you talk about commercial lending, when you talk about what else needs to be done in certain areas, because we stay so focused. And I can't even begin to tell you how some of these major banks are going to begin lending. I, I can tell you that a lot of my friends that are in, involved in uh, commercial real estate and development, it's all dried up. <coughs> There's nothing being done right now. And they're all calling us. Well, can you just make us a, you know, a loan? Well, you know, we don't. What proportion yeah. of your business is in home market? 100 percent. I, I like your commitment to the community. So much of their problem is these poor quality mortgages have been sold and sold and resold. And for all you know, people who actually hold it are in Germany or somewhere else. But when you have a person in your community, a, a lender from your bank who's having problems, I just lost my job or something like that, how, what can you do or what do you do to help that person through these difficult times? I, statistically, I can't tell you exactly, 
but I can tell you this, that anyone who calls us back or takes our phone call, um, we're working through the problems with them, hand in hand. There's a certain segment of the population, when they st stop paying their mortgage, you can't find them. They don't call you, they won't take your calls, um, so it gets pretty frustrating, and that, that's a certain percentage. But anyone that we're able to contact and, and talk to, we're generally speaking, right now especially, able to work out something, some kind of payment plan somewhere, <laughs> stop it from going into foreclosure. Because the last thing we want to do is to have a, a, a house go into foreclosure and somebody lose their home. That's the last thing. How are you? I'm doing fine. Great. The questions haven't been too bad. Good. <laughs> um, I believe that, you know, it's going to be hard for all any of us to say how to fix this problem in the country. Yeah. But I do know that what we have control over is our day-to-day -day and our neighborhoods and what we're about. That we have complete control over and we don't have to worry about messages on high fixing things. So I really am impressed. I'm in Slavic Village. I live in the Slavic Village. I'm really impressed that you've stayed where your roots are. And I believe if we build up our neighborhoods and our cities, everything else will take care of itself. You start at the bottom of any problem, work your way up. You do what you do each day. With that in mind, I really believe, to me, one of the things the city ought to be looking at in banking in general is more live-work situations. Because of the economy, it's where we started as a country. People had you know, a little restaurant downstairs, a bakery or a business, a garage out back. And that is the toughest lending that there is. It's outside of a commercial or industrial. The residential people won't put it up. I have a number of properties in the Slavic Village area. Yeah. You got to buy them cash. Yeah. So the people that have money that could bring money into the city where you have lower overhead and you're more efficient and it's better for mankind, they can't get anything but a 10-year loan with a lot of money down. And, and it's a, it's a, and, but they're living there. You know, there's a lot of instances all over the city where we have live work, live work circumstances that people would come in and bring money to the city if they could get a loan as that being their house. It's a real gray area. Is anyone going to address that? Because they're, they're liquid people. They're good credit risk. You know, that was the basis for Slavic Village. Uh, That's right. A long time ago, we, we used to do a lot of lending like that. Um, uh, I don't know if that will come back. It seems to make sense that it would or could or should. Why not? Why not? Exactly. Um, who's going to lend on that? Um, it'd be a stretch for us right now. But, uh, but I'm sure. Still that should be by the people, not the property. It's well, the people's ability to pay back and what their values and their trustworthiness sure, is. Sure, sure. And that's where the banks are invaluable because those are the kinds of things that banks actually do. And unfortunately, you know, our, our scope is very, very small in terms of our commitment. But there's, I think there's plenty people of banks out there, there that can do that. They do it as commercial. Yeah. Ten-year, high money up front. It's still somebody's home, and it's what brings the neighborhoods back. I understand. I understand. When there's um, an aspect of, of business that you are or working within a community, doing social and community development, that you, is outside of what you do, do you often use collaboration or partnerships with other institutions to help make those things happen for uh, you? You mean like big banking institutions? Yeah. Community or, development or you mean corporations. Community, yeah, we do a lot with community development, a lot, a lot with... Uh, smaller organizations that do make a difference and they're in it for the right reason. They have a value system, they, they get it, they understand what, what needs to be accomplished. We've done very few or if any partnerships with, with any larger organization because the mission is different. The mission is to get uh, uh, for the incoming chair, and it's not that these folks don't do good, good work, but the incoming chair wants the, the prestige and wants the, the glossy paper. And we just don't do business usually with, with larger organizations for that reason. Because our heart's in it to accomplish something within the community for the people that really need to be helped and not for some political reason or for some, uh, some news media coverage. So to partner, you're saying that there has to be some kind of shared values I'd say so, and yeah. ideals? Most definitely. Okay. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm a finance major and my question's related to that. Over the past few months, even though you haven't participated in the TARP program, which is fantastic, have you been able to take advantage of a lot of the Federal Reserve's programs where you can borrow at close to zero and lend at four or five? And how has that affected your company's uh, outlook? Yeah, we've done some of that, but it really hasn't been dramatic. Um, 
I, uh, Dave Huffman, our, our CFO, is here today, and he's working on a program where he can borrow from the Federal Home Loan Bank at 0.26%, so we can lend it out at 3 or 4 or something like that. Um, right now, I think there's a 60-day window or 90-day window on something like that. He's working on a 10-year program. If he does that, next time he'll be sitting here <laughs> talking to all of you. Um, but yeah, there is some of that. We, we haven't done a lot. Yes, ma'am. We're sitting in an environment of social workers and so, uh, social services. What do you suggest either in the future of the curriculum or presently for students and uh, people who are in the field and working uh, with the public in helping to move this, not for the world necessarily, but at least for the individuals and neighborhoods and perhaps this community? Yeah, I think that the biggest thing that uh, education can do is focus in on business ethics. Single biggest mission, I would say. I would throw a challenge out there to whoever's in education. Is it would be business ethics. Because as you can see, where it can lead to if you don't have those business ethics. I recently read an article that talked about that um, many of the business schools across the country have actually done what they've been supposed, what they've been chartered to do, and that's educate people going out in the world and having them focus in on how well that they can run their business and how much money they can make for the shareholders. And that's okay, except um, I think we forgot about business ethics along the way. And maybe it take a little less profit to be a little bit more ethical. You had a meeting with um, the students uh, at, uh, before this session started. Yeah, that was tougher than were, this. Yeah, and they were. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and one of the um, comments of the students is that many of the values that you espouse are very similar to those of, of social work and mm -hmm. of those who are engaged in community and social development. Yeah. And so it was, I thought, very enforcing for them to hear that from you. Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you for the second opportunity. Uh, your roots are in Slavic Village. Why Broward County? Broward County is a, a county where we found that a lot of people from northeastern Ohio happen to move to. <laughs> and uh, we have followed the population from Cleveland down to the east coast and west coast of, of Florida. Um, and it's been uh, very good for us. So we're just following our customers. And if you think about it, as the baby boomers are retiring, it's not a bad place to be. And 60% of the population of the U.S. lives this side of the Mississippi, and most people are going south somewhere. Uh, you know, just walk outside today, you'd say, why do we do this? <laughs> you know, my hair got blown all over the place. <laughs> you know, shoveling snow on Easter is not my favorite thing to do. I mean, we all, we all go through that, and I got a feeling that it's going to continue to be very good for, for a company like ours. Got a question here. Yes. I'm a realtor, and I have found this to be the best spring market since 2006. And I think pending home sales are really going to go up in March based on our experience. But um, you really burst my bubble when you said this was a blip on the screen, you know, wh what's going on in the market now, because home sales are looking OK right now. But my question is, what has created this demand that's going on right now over the last six weeks or two months? Is it the $8,000 tax credit? Is it pent up demand? Is it, you know, enthusiasm about a new administration? Or what is it? And so therefore, when is it going to end? <laughs> yeah, there, there's a couple things here. Um, first of all, um, the last time I addressed a group, I mean, officially like this was in 2005. I am not very good at being political. I'm not that good at, I'm good at being direct. Um, and so my being politically correct doesn't necessarily, it's not one of my best traits. Um, what am I trying to say here? Sorry, I burst your bubble. <laughs> <laughs> but how many here have been in this kind of war before with the economy? I mean, nobody. I mean, it's bad. It's bad. Foreclosures are just off the charts. So uh, why are we in this kind of thing? Uh, rates are... Now, when's the last time anyone here in this room saw a rate, uh, besides Mr. Kobach and Stefanik here, maybe Vic Gelb, below, um, below 5%? I mean, it, it should be good. And there's plenty of inventory. 
In fact, we have a lot of inventory that we could have you represent and <laughs> sell for us. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's part of what's going on. I mean, the rates are really good. Um, and and uh, I don't know. If, you know, if the job, if, you, if you're able to hold on to your job, employment can, can not, you know, kill us. I think we'll be okay. But that's the big unknown right now. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to step back to a larger question or a larger um, point of view. My sense is that our economy, up until recently, was predicated on people buying things with credit. That's unsustainable. I wonder if you have any sense of what the new basis of our economy could be that is uh, more ethical than buying things we don't need with money we don't have. Or realistic. Yeah, well, we, that's, that's the crux of the problem. Um, in, in fact, we've got to go through a whole different mindset. That's why we talked about the paradigm shifting. Um, the expectations are way, way too great. We've all been blessed with 20 plus years, maybe 25 years of, of just unbelievable growth and prosperity. And if you pick up Time Magazine, most recent article talks about a reset button. And they talk about in the first column, uh, the first or second paragraph, how because uh, everyone's getting, you know, uh, all these things, uh, consumers are consuming more so than ever before because of easy credit, we're also gaining weight. And the average person's gained about one pound a year, so everybody's not necessarily here in this room. <laughs> but everyone's about 20 pounds heavier than they would have been without this kind of wonderful stuff going on. I mean, I, it is a major, major issue, and the mindset has to change. Because I grew up in an environment where my dad would say, well, if you can afford to, to buy it, then go ahead and buy it. So I didn't buy very much. <laughs> Parents didn't give me a whole lot of money whenever I had I worked for, and that sounds like old school, and it was. I, I, I struggle with trying to do that with my children, and it doesn't work. To, you know, everyone's got too much. Everyone's and our expectations for I think for everyone, it's just it's just so high. You know, I just uh, uh, tried to get my my uh, twenty year old who played hockey for two years uh, into college, and I can't, I can't believe how many he applied to and how many rejection letters he got. I mean. He's a good student. He's probably the best student in our family. And when they find out who the real father is, they're really going to be <laughs> questions. But uh, he, 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 had the great, he had a great profile, and I'm telling you, he, he didn't, if he applied to 12 or 13 colleges, he got into two, which we were kind of surprised. You, you, you said one of your corporate values was uh, joy in daily work life. Would yes. you tell us a little bit about how you do that? <laughs> oh, we have fun. Is fun with one another. Um, w one of the things I wanted to get back to over here, the question was, you know, how do we do this differently or better than somebody else? We make it a habit of, uh, it, it's just kind of hokey, so bear with me. Um, I'm a big fan of, of, um, of the Knights of the Round Table and King Arthur and Camelot. And where we can have a round table, where we can have a round setting, uh, we have a rotunda, actually, that where we have our lunches and big meetings. Uh, we do that. And so, you know, that's why there's a, a wonderful balance in our organization when we're making decisions. You hear on everybody's side and everyone's got an equal say. Uh, I guess at the end of the day, the responsibility is mine, but we do have a huge amount of input from our folks. And we have fun with it. We, we uh, I don't know, some of the, some of the things we do, we have a, I, I'm in a rock band, and we have a, a band event for our associates and their families and invite them to some venue. We've done the Rock Hall and the House of Blues and down at Nautica, which is not Nautica anymore. Um, and, and we have their families, and you know, I'm there personally greeting everyone and talking to people. We have fun that way. We, have, uh, we had a fun day at work yesterday, which I missed. Um, I didn't get the memo. And I wore, a suit. I wore a suit, and everyone else wore wigs or hats. Now, that sounds kind of silly. But, but the purpose of it is, is to relay to people that we are a very, very relationship-based organization. And when my, any one of my associates has a, an issue at home with their wife or spouse or, or child, it's as important as, as if my family was sick. You know, we don't take that lightly. 
we, we have some great stories of, of some sad situations with families where we've pitched in and helped out. Not for, the, not for the glossy paper or the media. This is all people helping people. And we do that as a community. We make that a, as a regular part of who we are and what we do. We have a commit to fit program. We have a smoke uh, quitting program where someone can earn actually $1,000 for quitting smoking. I mean, that's unprecedented. I don't know who, who else does that. And I stole an idea from the Cleveland Clinic. We made our campus smoke free. And everyone thought it was my idea at work, so I didn't, I didn't argue with them. But, but there's so many good things going out there that you can do with a, with a company. You actually can do. Um, but you have to put your ego somewhere. And so if you ever see me driving, uh, get out of my way, because that's where my ego is. Because I have no ego at home. <laughs> at home, it's impossible. I have five children at home and a beautiful wife, and I'm telling you, it, it doesn't work at home. And at the office, there's a beautiful balance of how we operate and how we make decisions, so it doesn't happen there. But get me behind the wheel and look out. <laughs> we have time for one more question. I don't have a microphone, but can you hear me? Oh, yeah. uh, sure. First, I want to commend you because I just, I just recently looked at the lending from the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act for 2007, I think it was, at last available. You made almost more loans to any, uh, than any other bank to African Americans in the city of Cleveland. And you did it with a less than 1% foreclosure rate compared to National City at 9%. And of course, some of the notorious banks, Argent was at 60%. What you did was exactly what the Community Reinvestment Act was requiring banks to do. Now, I know you said you did it voluntarily, and that's commendable. But I'm concerned when you said that the problem we ended up with was due to CRA. If CRA is requiring two fundamental things, it's requiring access to credit fairly and equally for people of color, but doing it safely and soundly, not no doc loans, not without any, you know, no guarantee that people can pay back. Sure. How is that a contributing factor to our foreclosure problem? Because the loans from 1977 when CRA was passed to 1995, virtually no increase in foreclosure. Yeah, well, if, if you heard the rest of my explanation. I was in the peanut gallery. So ah, OK. There but are I, peanuts on the table. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone heard, else heard this explanation. Is that it's, it's not one thing that caused this. Yes. It's a lot of things. It was the perfect storm. But even that, but how is that even one of the contributing factors? I guess, you know, everyone's entitled to an opinion. My opinion is it was part of it. When the government regulates and tells a business it's got to do something, and people and businesses are making decisions based on what the government tells them, I got a problem with it. You know, okay. I think that there should be some kind of ethical or moral or value-based decision-making process, which would kind of mute the, the governmental regulation, and not have that have to be part of our societal influences on business. That's just a philosophical issue. But there are a lot of contributing factors. And uh, I think the drive to, to make loans in communities just to post numbers, I think, is very, very evident. And I think the foreclosure rate will reflect that. And I also think that um, um, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Your point well taken, though. Right. Well, it's actually my sad responsibility to end this wonderful discussion today. Uh, you know, when we. Perhaps we should all record in our diaries a remarkable thing that on April 3rd, 2009, people gra gathered in Cleveland, Ohio, and were actually happy with a banker. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Very kind. Uh, Mark, uh, Mark, Mark Stefanski, I, I want to thank you for what you've shared with us today. We did have a wonderful meeting with, with our students. I want to mention that a number of those students were Lewis Stokes Fellows, and Congressman Stokes is here with us today. And those students are, be, are being trained in, to follow through on the mission that he has represented all of his life on and helping people in the community. And uh, we, th we thank you for Utah and Congressman Stokes. And we thank our, our students. Uh, Mr. Stefanski has shared with us today the the values that he holds in his corporation and, and really his family values that have gone through the corporation. And obviously your parents did a good job at the family table with you as I know you're doing with your family. And 
we really appreciate your sharing that with us today. And Thank I, you very you much. have to keep in mind that I heard that voice. There's still time. There's still time. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to turn it over to President Snyder. Well, you have honored us with your presence. And you we don't much. have much to honor you with except our great thanks. And we do want you to take this as a memento. And we will give you a recording of your, your uh, talk today. Well, but we you. want you to take this as a memento of your visit. Truly, you have enriched our campus. We are so pleased to be able to share with our community, with our students and others here, uh, the values of great leaders. And that's what part of what we stand for. So thank you for helping us make that happen today. Well, thank you very much. And this says, distinguished visiting lecturer, my family will realize. <laughs> you have truly um, lived up to that. someone else, huh? You have truly lived up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope so.